Good morning and uh, welcome to this service for Palm Sunday. Also welcome to those of you who are watching on Zoom and uh, later on those who will be watching on YouTube or Facebook. So today is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning, doesn't it, of Holy Week, a week that really changed the world eternally and thousands of years ago and it continues to change our lives today. So it's a source of great hope. The theme for our Easter celebrations this year is Easter Unlocked, and it's fairly obvious why we chose that particular theme, because uh, we're well aware, haven't we, we've experienced almost a year now of being locked down. And uh, when you hear that word, I don't know what it conjures up in your mind, but I think eternally now, it will, for me, it will be a time of restrictions, limitations, deprivations, barriers, obstacles, hurdles to be overcome. And uh, probably for many of us at times, it's left us feeling overwhelmed, isolated, and, and maybe quite low-spirited, which some of us may feel like today. But uh, as we journey through Easter, the events and the significance of Easter are completely and totally in the other direction, aren't they? So Easter is all about things getting unlocked, barriers and obstacles being removed, life opening up, restrictions being lifted, leading to us being blessed, encouraged and renewed, and life blossoming again, and how we especially need that message this year, don't we? So today we start the journey through Easter week of unlocking and asking what was unlocked? What was it that was unlocked on the first Palm Sunday and how is that of any relevance to us today? So let's just focus our minds as we come to Palm Sunday. And in fact, the whole of Easter, the focus is very much just on one city, isn't it? It's in the city of Jerusalem. Psalm 24 is a psalm where David reminds us that absolutely everything that exists belongs to God, doesn't it? He is the glorious, he's the eternal king. So he is deserving of our worship and we welcome his glorious reign afresh into our lives. This particular psalm, it's thought, may have been written for another momentous occasion when the Ark of the Covenant was moved from Obed-Edom's house up to Jerusalem. But also many see a prophetic sign of, uh, when, with the repeated proclamation at the end of this of the first coming of the Messiah, the King, and because there's two, the first and the second coming. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas, he established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? 
who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Hallelujah. It's no doubt that this day is somehow about Jesus being Lord and King, isn't it? And that's why we've got the banner here, Jesus, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. We're here to acknowledge him. We're here as those who do seek him and rejoice in him as our Lord and our King. So please stand and you're allowed in this time to move your body in any way that's appropriate. Um, and you can move your lips in any way that I can't see under your mask there, or you know, you can harm or do a gentle whatever. But uh, let's worship our King in these next two songs. You're the King of glory, and Hosanna, Lord, we lift up your name. So let's join as we come together, let's stand and uh, move as appropriately. Thank you.
And although we can't sing out loud our praises, which is what we would long to do, you know our hearts, and we want to acknowledge you today in our midst as our God, our King. King of kings, Lord of lords, we are so grateful, Lord, that the whole of this universe belongs to you. It's not in the hands of any other being. It belongs to you. Everything belongs to you. Thank you. You are our God. You're our Lord. You're the creator of all things. You're our creator. And therefore, we willingly and gladly bow the knee to you and to no other. And Lord, as we celebrate your kingship and your lordship at the beginning of this Holy Week, Lord, we know everything that we reflect upon and remember in this week ahead, all the joys, the joy of this day, and then all the sorrows that come later in the week as we reflect again on your death, that cruel death upon the cross for each one of us, Lord. It's too amazing for us to take it in, actually. We just don't really grasp it. We are a grateful people. We're a thankful people. And we thank you that death was not the end, but you came through, and we look forward to the joy of the resurrection. So, Lord, be in our midst today, Lord, as we celebrate your lordship, your kingship, as we worship you, Lord, as we honor you, Lord. Even if we can't sing, let worship be released in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise and all adoration. So, Lord, this morning we are those who seek your face. And, Lord, we do also seek and want to receive a blessing from your hand. Lord, as we see everything that got unlocked in this week, Lord, you know how we struggled in this last year with being locked down. All that it's meant, all those deprivations, all those barriers and obstacles and hurdles. But we thank you that at Easter you opened up so much for us. So let us rejoice. Let us have heads that are lifted up today. Lord, if we're feeling bowed down, as many of us will be, lift up our heads that we may acknowledge you. Lord, let us forget about ourselves. Let us concentrate on you. Let us worship you. Let us receive all the good that you want to bring into our lives. And Lord, we thank you that you love each one of us. The message of Easter is that you loved us so much that you gave your only son that any of us who choose to put our faith and trust in you, we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. What a well, that's not just a bonus, that is, that's miraculous, that is so wonderful. And Lord, we thank you that not only that, you've placed your Holy Spirit within us so that we could live well in these troublesome days on earth. Thank you that we have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Lord, we don't deserve it, but we acknowledge with gratitude that you have placed your life within us. And so let's just sing that lovely hymn or sing or hum or listen. King of kings, majesty in royal robes, I don't deserve, but I live to serve your majesty.
Amen. Please take your seats. This is a cue for Tony to come down. Um, Tony's multitasking today, and he's man. That's amazing, isn't it? But uh, that's good. So the events of Palm Sunday are recorded in all four of the Gospels. So it must have been pivotal, pivotal, a moment which set in motion all the events that were going to lead up to the crucifixion on Good Friday and then obviously the resurrection on Sunday. So Tony's going to come and read Luke's account. It's Luke 19 verses 28 to 44. Thanks, Tony. Morning, everybody. Um, sorry, what was it? 28? 19, 20. 19, 20. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's a clue. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. Left. Yeah, oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the crowd goes down the Mount of Olives, sorry, where the, the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles I'd seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the, the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Mm. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> So I guess that's conjured up some images for some of us who've been uh, to Israel. We'll see those images a little bit later. So as we uh, come to another Holy Week, the question is, what was it that was getting unlocked on that Palm Sunday? What was really going on? It was clearly a highly emotionally charged situation. And as we read Luke 19, if you're reading through the Gospel and you get to Luke 19, you do sense that things are beginning to hot up by the time we get here and there's a lot of tension rising and we're reading this now with a sense of foreboding because we know what is ahead and we do sense don't we that uh, these events weren't just random they weren't just happening uh, just uh, off, off the cuff they were they were certainly it seems being orchestrated there was a hand behind this the hand of God leading and guiding this to its conclusion but in order for us to really grasp what was going on, because it's quite a complex time, this, isn't it? Because everything's joyful and happy, and then a few days later, it seems to all go sour. So we need to understand what really was going on. What was the backdrop? Once we understand the backdrop, we can unravel what was going on, and we can see what God really was doing. So as we've said, and as these banners tell us, I was in Nazareth last year and I bought these banners for last Easter, thinking they'd look good, and of course we were in lockdown last Easter, so they're up this year, just to remind us that the place of Palm Sunday was extremely important. It had to be Jerusalem. It couldn't have been London, Paris, or New York. It just wouldn't have worked. It had to be Jerusalem, the holy city, the most important city for every Jew. So the place was important. The timing was crucial as well. It's vital to understand. Today is the first day of Holy Week, 
And last night in the evening and today is the first day of Passover. And so it's quite clear that this was played out on this very day. It couldn't have been any other time. It was the Passover. And the reason for that is that Jerusalem was thronging with Jews from all over the world. It was a busy place, hustle and bustle. So there was a full parade of people there who would have witnessed what was going on. And secondly, because it was Passover, people were full of fervor. They were full of nationalism. This was their most important festival. Do you remember it marked their liberation out of Egypt? And so at this time, there was a heightened sense that more liberation was coming. They were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And what better place to feel that fervor than in the streets of Jerusalem amid all those crowds? So Jesus clearly chose his time carefully. This wasn't a quiet weekend. This wasn't out of season. This was in the full view of people from all around the world so that he got maximum exposure to the large crowds full of such zeal. Third thing we need to understand is the very different groups of people that are mentioned in the readings. There were four different groups because only then we'll understand how did it turn from this to rejection a few weeks later. Well, first of all, there were Jesus' close disciples. They were very busy, weren't they? They were doing errands for Jesus. We've had the story, they were running to places, trying to find donkeys and colts and talking to owners um, because it had to be a donkey. Just as an aside, I had a lovely donkey encounter this week up at Mile Oak Farm. I don't know if you go up there. Some of you go up there. I know Jan does. I meet, met Ian and Elka up there with their grandson. And uh, there's some lovely donkeys up there. If you want a bit of donkey therapy, Mile Oak Farm is the place. There's three donkeys up there. I met Rolo, who was in the um, newsletter this week. And then there's a little one called Mabel. I think it's Mabel anyway. It's a tiny donkey. And then, of course, there's good old Albert, who is our favorite. He's not very friendly. He's a bit ratty these days, but uh, Albert's there. So we have donkeys. So the disciples were about the business of Jesus getting the donkey sorted out. Whether or not it had been arranged in advance, we're never sure, but it, uh, it all worked out well, didn't it? So we have the close disciples. And then in verse 30, 37, we have a crowd of disciples. So there was a wider following. And these were people who were getting intrigued by Jesus. They'd seen him do miracles. That's always attractive, isn't it? You know, if you've done miracles, you're going to get a following. But uh, they were putting on a good show on this day. They were prepared to go along with the crowd and do a happy, let's do some hosannas. But this was the crowd that were going to turn against him later in the week. There were plenty of them. They were surface followers, but it didn't go very deep. And then there was the third group in verse 39, the Pharisees. On this day, the Pharisees, the religious establishment, they were not happy bunnies, were they? They were not. They were definitely not in party mood. And they certainly didn't want anyone else to be in party mood either. And they were getting increasingly rattled, increasingly angry for what they saw was happening. And then there's a fourth group, which actually aren't mentioned in the scriptures, but uh, we know from history would be there. And they're also important as a backdrop. There was the, all the Ro Roman soldiers who would have been in Jerusalem that day. The Romans who were the occupying power would have been very much in evidence on this day of Passover, because it was always a time when uprisings could happen. There could be trouble, as we've seen on our streets recently, You've got to get people in to deal with the uprisings. And so there were those four different groups. Referring to the Roman soldiers, there's something else that I've always found fascinating. You might know this. We don't read about it in the Bible, but we read about it in history. So it's good to know your background. <clears throat> because actually on that day, two processions were going on at the same time. One in the east of Jerusalem, and one in the West. And they're there to give us the contrast. And that's why, again, Jesus chose this very day to heighten his sense of what he was going to unlock on that day. You see, in the East, we have Jesus riding into Jerusalem in the manner prophesied in 
Zechariah. Probably this is the one verse of Zechariah that we all know. I'm sure we're not all Zechariah experts. Granville is, he reads Zechariah. But if you know your Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. He's righteous. He's having salvation. He's gentle. And he's riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So any Jews at the time who knew their scriptures would immediately have interpreted Jesus riding in in the east of Jerusalem. This was a prophetic act. And they were aroused, they were excited because here was Jesus, King and Messiah, coming to inaugurate a new age, a new kingdom that was going to replace the old order. Salvation was being offered, we hear in Zechariah. A rescue from earthly kingdoms, and certainly they felt that should be a rescue from the um, occupying force of Rome that was detestable to them. And they were looking forward, like we do, to a kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace. So they were excited. They were full of expectation with this particular parade. And then there was another procession going on, which was in the west of Jerusalem. This time, it was Pontius Pilate. He was riding not a donkey, but a war horse. It would have been majestic. It would have been brushed and polished like we see when our queen is having her um, trooping of the color or whatever. So he would have been flanked by a column of soldiers resplendent in their dress. They were wanting to put on a great show for all the people who come for Passover to make sure that every Jew knew who really was in control. So it was a display of Roman imperial power. That's where authority lay, and that's there. they were there to keep all the fervor under control. So can you see that Jesus definitely chose his moments? This was no accident. So this was the context that he was going to play out the high drama, knowing full well where it was going to land him. He was not oblivious to that. He knew what it would cost him by the end of the week. So now we know the backdrop, we can understand and maybe grasp afresh what is it that was getting unlocked that day? What gets unlocked for you and me that could have a major impact on our lives so many thousands of years later? Well, three things really. It's a bit like a three-point sermon, you know. I haven't had one of those for a while. But uh, firstly, we can say Jesus more than ever before was publicly and unashamedly unlocking his true identity, wasn't he? Up till now, he'd been a bit uh, guarded, hadn't he? Do you remember all those times, don't tell anybody who I am? He was a bit coy. He didn't want too many to know who he was. He wasn't the kind of man who'd go around blowing his own trumpet, telling everyone bluntly, look, this is who I am. He wasn't interested, actually, in a large popular following. That didn't interest him one iota. He was looking for people who were prepared to work it out, work it through, and discover who he really was. So it's fascinating, as we see his 12 followers, beginning to find faith. They didn't get it very quickly, did they? That's why he needed three years. But gradually, as you read through the Gospels, you see people like Peter. Do you remember when Peter, up at Caesarea Philippi, do you remember when we went up there to Banyas? When Jesus, uh, Peter said, Jesus said to Peter, who, who do people think I am? Do you remember what Peter said? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, bless you, Peter. It's been revealed to you. So gradually, gradually, faith was growing in a number of people. We have others, don't we? Thomas and uh, Philip. Do you remember Philip saying, show us God. Jesus, will you show us God? And then we'll all be okay. Do you remember that? That was in John 14. And Jesus said, Peter and Philip, you know, haven't you got it yet? If you've seen me, what did he say? You've seen God. So gradually, faith was growing. But up to this point, Jesus had kind of kept it a bit under wraps, hadn't he? But on this day, it all changed. Publicly, 
he made it absolutely clear. He, he unlocked totally his claim to kingship, to messiahship, and to being Lord. He didn't hold back on this, did he? He thought, right, this is it now. Everybody's going to know who I really am. And so what began at his birth, do you remember the coming of the kings, the magi, whoever they were, from the east, they came to worship him as king. And now this kingship is being played out as a fully grown man, not just as a baby in a manger. His kingship is being revealed to all. Now, this morning for us, we are those who have, I guess, I don't know what goes on inside your heart, but I've acknowledged him as my king. Amen? I think most of us have. He is king. He is Lord. We're not Jews, so we haven't been looking for a Messiah as such, but we certainly do need a king and a Lord. And it is vital that we know Jesus' identity. We've got to be absolutely sure of who Jesus is. He's not just a good man. That would be nonsense. If you've read your Bible at all, you would know you couldn't just come up and say, well, he's a good man. Oh, he's just a prophet. Oh, he's a teacher. You can't read the Gospels and come to that conclusion. You'd have missed the point altogether. We've got to get his identity absolutely correct, and that's what he unlocked that day. Later on, I think Paul put it in the best way possible. If you're in any doubt who Jesus is, read what Paul says. In Colossians 1, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation, not just some man walking around Jerusalem. For by him all things were created. In he things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. That links us back to Psalm 24, doesn't it? God owns everything. Jesus is saying, I own everything because I am God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Thankfully, that's good, isn't it? He is the head of the church. He is the head of his body, the church. For he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is no one greater than Jesus. Don't even look for him. You won't find anybody greater and higher and more powerful than Jesus because he has the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell inside him. You can't get more than that. If you chop Jesus in half, he would be divine, through and through, divine God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Can't say it better than that, can you? That is who Jesus is. And that day, Palm Sunday, first Palm Sunday, he said, right, I'm not going to hold back anymore. People are going to know who I am. So I hope we've all worked that out because that is vital. If you don't work that out, you can't really be follower of Jesus. That's what faith is. When you gradually come to that point of thinking, oh, that's who he is. I found him and I'm going to rejoice in him. So that was definitely unlocked that first Pine Sunday, his true identity that never before had it been so blatantly clear as on that day. Linked to that, the second thing that was un unlocked that day, it's the place of who gets the worship of our hearts. You know, because man is definitely a worshipping being. I don't know about animals, but I know about men. Men and women are worshippers. And it was G.K. Chesterton that says, if a man ceases to worship God, he doesn't worship nothing, he worships anything. And Jesus knew that long before G.K. Chesterton said it. Jesus had an amazing capacity to know what was going on inside human hearts. I don't have that capacity. I have no idea what's going on inside you at the moment. But if Jesus was standing here, how scary would that be? He would know everything that was going on <clears throat> inside human beings. And he knew too well that uh, 
people chose who they were going to worship. There was never a vacuum. So on that day, another thing he unlocked is he said, yeah, I am worthy of your worship. The person you should be worshipping is me. He never actually directly said that as clearly before, but on that day he unlocked it. I am the one that you should worship because I as God in the flesh. Some of us on Monday evenings have been doing the Ten Commandments. I won't give you a test on if you know all ten because you won't get all ten. I'm pretty sure you won't get all ten. It's difficult to remember them all, but you should remember the first one because the first one is foundational. It's the foundational to your life and to my life, it's foundational to a society. It says, you shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. So Jesus on this day was opening that and saying, yes, you've got to worship God and I'm here. You need to worship me. But he could tell that day who was really worshipping and who wasn't. He was a realist. He knew. It didn't knock his confidence in one slightest bit, did he? Because he says that lovely words, if you're not going to worship me, I'm not worried, because the stones themselves will cry out. That's a brilliant line, isn't it? Because he made everything, so he made the stones. So even inanimate objects will be able to recognize who is their God. So he was not phased. He simply knew that people had choices. And sadly, most of the people who were in the crowd that day weren't really worshipping, actually. They were just joining in the fun. When push came to shove, they were not going to give Jesus their allegiance. And certainly that was the response that Jesus gave was rattling the cages further of the Jewish authorities. But that day, worship got unlocked. We're left in no shadow of a doubt who we should be worshipping. And that's a choice we all make. I can't tell you, well I know most of you here do worship God. I know that because I know you. But it's not inevitable because people have to make a choice. Who really gets your allegiance deep down? Who really has got your heart? Who's won your heart? Because there's lots of other alternatives. Money, that's a great one. Self, actually. Most people worship themselves. They're not worshipping God at all. They're just selfish. Football. You know, some people worship Brighton and Hove Albion or West Ham United. I never get that. It's okay for a bit of fun. But it's pretty irrelevant, isn't it? But some people, really, their allegiance and their hearts and their times and their energies to give them to such lesser things. Some people worship their families. Now, families are incredibly important, but they're not to be worshipped. There's only one place where we give our worship, and that is to God. And Jesus, on this day, was saying, worship me. That got unlocked that day. So we're not ignorant. We know where worship is should lie. And so this Easter time, I pray that whatever else we do, you will have moments when you really worship Jesus. You worship him for who he is. You worship him later for the, in the week for his death, because his death was for you. We need to cross that. His death was for you and for me, and we'll worship him for his resurrection, because that gives us all hope. Particularly as we get older, we need hope, don't we? And the hope of, because I live, you also will live, really rings more and more truthfully. So tell Jesus sometime over this Easter that he's won your heart, that you're really a worshipper, because you can't actually be a Christian if you're not a worshipper. You have to give your heart, your allegiance to Jesus. That's a choice we all have to make. But encourage each one of us with this. Sadly... The majority of the crowd weren't worshipping Jesus. They were using him for their own ends. And when he didn't match up to what they wanted, 
chucked him out. That's happened so much, doesn't it, around us. People use God, and if he doesn't play their game, then he gets rejected. That's not worship at all. And so, make sure we worship from our innermost being, not surface. Don't know where your innermost being is, but it's deep down somewhere. Deep, deep down. Unlock that. And then, as I think it's the shorter, I think it's the shorter Westminster Catechism. It says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The only place, the only way you'll enjoy God is when you worship him. If you've never come to worship, you will not enjoy the presence of God. But if you worship, you'll have some of the best times you can possibly imagine. Finally, the third thing that was beginning to be unlocked that day was the New Testament way of salvation. Not the Old Testament way, the New Testament way of salvation in the coming of Jesus and what was going to happen later in this week. Sadly, on Palm Sunday, it comes in a rather negative way. Because in verse 41, we have Jesus stopping and weeping. He wept or wept over Jerusalem. Now, when I think of this, I have pictures in my mind. Some of them are going to come up on the screen. Those of you who've visited Jerusalem, these pictures will be I think real in your minds. I think they're going to come up anytime soon. Yeah! Anyone know where this is? If you've been to Israel, it's a church. It's the Teardrop Church. A bit like the one in Sompting. You know the one in Sompting? That's a bit of this shape. This is the Teardrop Church, and it's called Dominus Flavit, which is the Latin for Jesus wept. So this is on the Mount of Olives. This would have been a place where Jesus stopped and he was overcome with grief. And as we look through the window of this church, beautiful window, and if you look at it in the right place, you get the cross over the Dome of the Rock. I always love that, if you get it in the right place. But from this, Jesus looked out over the city of Jerusalem. A beautiful, um, it's a beautiful sight, this, isn't it? Those have been there. And he wept. And as you come out of the church, you start seeing that was Jerusalem. And he knew what was going to be holding. This sounds a bit like a tour guide or an advert for a trip to Israel, which it is. No, it's not. We might be going there this year or next year, possibly next year now. And finally, you remember the trek down. It's always better to walk down the Mount of Olives than walk up it. I once walked up it with um, quite a lot of African ladies. Some of you might be listening on Zoom, I'm not sure. And it was a trek to the top, I can tell you. We were exhausted. But walking down, you get this wonderful, wonderful view. And so this reminds us that Jesus, walking down the Mount of Olives, he wept. Why did he weep? Well, he wept because people were either unable or unwilling, and there's both, aren't there, to see their need, to face up to their need, and to get rescued. And he repeated it again at the end. He said it at the beginning, Drew, you don't understand. He said, let's just have a look. It says in Luke 19, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. And the last verse, it says, um, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So here was Jesus beginning to unlock the new plan of salvation, and most people said, not bothered, don't want it go away kind of thing. And so he wept at human beings' spiritual blindness. They couldn't recognize that the very hope that they needed was before their very eyes, and they were rejecting him. And he foretold that there would be disaster, and 40 years later there was terrible disaster like he was prophesying here with the destruction of Jerusalem. 
So we have on Palm Sunday the unlocking of the New Testament way of salvation, bringing peace with God. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring you to a place of peace with God. And it's better to be at peace with God than at war. It's better to receive him than to reject him. And we'll see that more fully unlocked as the week goes on. But let's make sure that we're not in that category of spiritually blind people. Not a good place to be. I'm amazed, aren't you, at how blind some people are? I can't see God. I can't see how they can't see. When we look out around us, why can't you see that God is real? But we know there are blind people. But let us have our eyes open. Make sure your eyes are fully opened to the way of the cross. Because the only way to peace with God, there's only one way, and it's through Jesus. There isn't another way. Sorry, I didn't say that. It's not what I'm saying. It's what the Bible says. There is only one way, and that is by coming to the foot of the cross. So let's put away all notions that we can earn our way into God, to peace with God, or we can buy it, or we can deserve it by our good works, or self-righteousness. I've heard that one, well, I'm not a bad person. Thinking, well, I am, so, you know, don't know. So let's not also think that we can get salvation by association. I've heard that one. Oh, my, my, my grandfather's a vicar. I'm thinking, so? <laughs> Does that give you a kind of extra special place. There is no salvation by association. There is only salvation by coming to the foot of the cross and accepting Jesus. But also put away all notions that you're beyond redemption. I've heard people over the years say that. Oh, God can't save me. I'm far too bad. No, rubbish. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Some of you might think, I've messed up too much. I could not possibly be rescued. Yes, you can. I think it was Billy Graham who said, the ground at the foot of the cross is very level. Welcomes everybody. So let us make sure that we really are grasping the message of Easter, that Jesus alone brings peace, and we'll only know the joy of that when we acknowledge his identity and we worship him in spirit and in truth. And so Palm Sunday gives us the first key. We've got the key. We just need to turn around from our unbelief and put our faith and our trust in God and keep it there. Keep it there till eternity, until we find that rescue and we have the answer to sin and to death and to evil. Hallelujah. Amen. So I love having the keys. You feel you've got a bit of power if you have the keys, don't you? I've got the keys to the church, so that gives me a bit of power. Sorry if you haven't got a key, but we can't give keys to everybody. But it's great. Right, before we think, sing our final song, on your chair, you've got a number of things that uh, hindered your seating today. But uh, first of all, you've got a lovely palm cross. I love palm crosses, don't you? Because these are all made in Africa somewhere. It gives... Um, some money to people, poor people in Africa who use their palms to make crosses. So Palm Sunday unlocked the journey to the cross. I don't know what you're going to do with your palm cross, but I would suggest you put it somewhere where you see it often. Don't stick it in a drawer. Put it in a window. I know the maples have theirs in their window. They've got last year's in their window, so maybe they have two there for now. I don't know where, but put it somewhere. Don't trash this. Put it somewhere where you know that this was for you. And you're going to need to honour Jesus at the foot of the cross to be safe. So that's the first thing. Take home. Don't leave it on the floor. You know, take it with you. If anyone needs to take one to a neighbour or a friend, let me know. We do have some spares. The second thing you've got on your chair... This is my attempt at a palm leaf. Not very good, I know, but I did my best. And you've got a pen. What I'd like you to do is, just in these moments, we're going to have a song playing about God, Jesus coming to rescue us, to come and save us. That's what Hosanna means, doesn't it? Lord, save us. 
Now, I want you to write on this leaf any names of people that you think you're praying you, they need rescuing. We've all got them in our families, haven't we? Maybe you want to put your own name on here. If you don't know, if you've never given your heart and your life to Jesus, put your own name on here because you need rescuing first. Then you can start rescuing, uh, helping to rescue other people. But we're going to have time for you to think and pray of who you want to put on these leaves. Afterwards, I'm going to ask you to leave them on a chair just at the front here, and then we're going to put them outside. I'm not going to read them all. Don't worry. We'll put them outside because we've got the donkey outside at that station. And we're asking God, please show salvation to these people. So you've got a few moments as we have the song playing.
each one of us has written on these leaves. They're people who are precious to us. They're our loved ones. They're our family. They're our friends. But Lord, we thank you that this week will tell us that you love them far more than we could ever love them. And your love... Thank you that your grace goes before, so we know you're already at work at some of these lives, drawing them to you. And Lord, we pray that there will be some blind eyes that are opened, that people are willing to see that they need you. That's a big step, Lord, for many to be humble enough to say, I need rescue. Let that happen in the lives of these people. Let them see who you are. Let scales fall from eyes like it did for Paul, who could finally write those wonderful words in Colossians. That's amazing. He was blind for so many years, but now he could see. So we pray for that. And we pray you will give us the joy of seeing some of our loved ones find and make their peace with God through you, we pray in your name. Amen. So you might want to take these home with you, but if you don't, then leave them there and we'll put them outside. Uh, we're going to stand and sing our last hymn, Blessing and Honour. Then we'll see if anyone's on Zoom. I'm not sure if they are or not, but we'll see. Some of them sneak off before the end so and get their cup of coffee quickly, but uh, we'll just welcome them before we just close. So let's stand together. Blessing and Honour.
One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a day that will be. Till that time comes, Lord, we are those who are already practicing for that. We're having good opportunities to worship and bow the knee to you. And that's what we want to do as we go from this place, Lord. We pray that this week as we worship you, we will enjoy you. We'll enjoy fellowship with you, Lord, that you will be the lifter of our heads. Lord, we're going to need that this week because there's going to be days when we bow down low and we need to come again to the foot of the cross and find our rescue and our salvation in you. So, Lord, accompany us this week. Be Emmanuel, God with us, we pray in your name.